far out in the ocean where the water is as blue as the prettiest cornflower and as clear as crystal. It is very, very deep, so deep indeed that no cable could fathom it. Many church steeples, piled one upon another, would not reach from the ground beneath to the surface of the water above. There dwell the sea king and his subjects. Hi everyone, my name's SJ. And my name is T. And we're Crumbs of Science. And this week, if you couldn't tell by the introduction, we are talking about the Little Mermaid. But not your Disney Little Mermaid. Gosh, no, that's way too pleasant. Instead, we want to talk about the original Little Mermaid by Hans Christian Andersen, published in 1837. Yeah, we're real hipsters like that. We're going <laughs> for the uh, the OG uh, Little Mermaid. Now, often when we, we've mentioned fairy tales... On here, there's been heaps of previous versions and it's come through. But Hans Christian Andersen, I think, was a little bit more original than the Brothers Grimm because they just collected the fairy tales, whereas Hans wrote it himself. So there are some previous versions of this fairy tale, such as Undine by Friedrich de la Motte Fouquet, very fancy name, published in 1811, where a water sprite marries a knight named Huldebrand to gain a soul. Very popular German romance at the time. There's also a French folktale, Melusine, where a water sprite marries a knight on the condition that he shall never see her on Saturdays when she becomes a mermaid again. Casual Saturday, as you do. And th there's also a theory that he was perhaps inspired by the occultist Paracelsus, whose full name, get ready for this one, was Philippus Aureolus Theophrastus Bombastus von Hohenheim who was around till 1541 and he was pretty big in the medical industry and he believed that sickness and health in the body relied upon the harmony of humans and nature. So if plants looked like part of the body, they could cure that part of the body. For example, one that I found was that orchid roots look like testicles so they can cure any testicle-associated illness, of course. And he thought that the four elements of a body had to be in line with each other and the four elements corresponded to four elemental beings salamanders for fire gnomes for earth sylphs for air and undines or mermaids for water so these might have been some of the inspirations for hans christian anderson but also at this time it was relatively well believed that mermaids were actually real and we'll discuss that a little bit later there was lots of evidence out there that mermaids existed many well-renowned thinkers believed in mermaids and there were even exhibitions of mermaids that would tour around England and around Europe at the time displaying mermaids or mermaid bones or artefacts from mermaids. So Hans Christian Andersen's Little Mermaid opens in a similar way to the Disney version. There is the sea king at the bottom of the ocean uh, who lives in a beautiful, beautiful castle. Um, the sea king uh, has, is a widower. Um, and in this story, the Sea King's mother is also um, around the home. She, the Sea King, and the six daughters of the Sea King uh, all live in this huge castle at the bottom of the ocean. Each of the daughters uh, is told by their grandmother that when you have reached your 15th year, you will have permission to rise up out of the sea to sit on the rocks in the moonlight while the great ships are sailing by, and then you will see both forests and towns. Each of the sisters is one year older than the other. The first sister goes up and she sees beautiful stars, beautiful towns. The second sister goes up, sees a bunch of things, so on and so forth, uh, until it's time for Ariel. She's actually never named in this one. I think that they came up with the name Ariel for the Little Mermaid, which actually used to be a male name before they used it in Disney. Interesting. Fun fact, I'm pretty sure. So the littlest mermaid floats up to to the surface, and as she gets to the surface, she sees a beautiful ship, uh, the ship so brightly illuminated that all the people and even the smallest rope could be distinctly and plainly seen, and how handsome the young prince looked as he pressed the hands of all present and smiled at them while the music resounded through the clear night air. But then a storm rolls in and picks the ship up and dashes it against the rocks. And during the storm, she 
finds the young prince who's floating through the water, uh, who's fast losing the power of swimming in that stormy sea. His limbs were failing him, his beautiful eyes were closed, and he would have died had not the little mermaid come to his assistance. She held his head above the water and let the waves drift them where they would. As soon as they wake up, she makes sure he's okay, and then she dives back into the water. He wakes up, and has, but he has no knowledge of who rescued him. We said before that Hans might have been influenced by some stories at the time, and mermaids had actually been around in culture for centuries and centuries. The first merperson, really, that was imagined was around 4,000 years ago, and it was Ea, a merman who was the Babylonian god of the sea, with the lower body of a fish and the upper body of a human. Helped people, brings them arts and sciences and battled evil, all the good stuff. And weirdly, he was the patron god of cleaners. You may be more familiar with his name when he was later co-opted by the Greeks and the Romans as Poseidon and Neptune. But the earliest mermaid, they suspect, was the ancient Syrian goddess Atargetus. Atargetus? Atargetus. Atargetus. Um, who watched over the fertility of her people and their general well-being and, of course, fish below human above. Now, people really actually believed in mermaids before the 18th century. So there was the great Roman naturalist who was called Pliny the Elder who wrote Natural History, which is pretty much the scientific gospel for the following centuries. And that was published in around 77-ish AD. And he wrote of nereids and nymphs, which are half human, half fish mermaids. And just wrote of them as being actually real. So the princess watches this happening and then she goes back home, but she is depressed. She is so lovesick and she pretty much just hangs out being lovesick. She eventually tells some of her sisters why she's so sad and they tell her where his palace is, which conveniently is right next to the water. Then there's a big party one night and she has a wonderful time at this underwater party that she's attending until she realises I can never be truly happy until I am with my one true love, the prince who has never met me and has no idea who I am. So she goes to see the sea witch. In this version, there is a very important distinction between mermaids and humans, not just the whole tail thing. In this story, humans have an immortal soul. And that immortal soul means that they, once they die, get to live forever in the... Unknown. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> the heavens. But mermaids don't have an immortal soul. And even though they live for over 300 years, once they die, they just turn into They're sea gone. foam. They, uh, they become the foam on the surface of the water and have not even a grave down here of those we love. We shall never live again. Like the green seaweed, once it has been cut off, we can never flourish more. As her grandmother tells her ever so sweetly, the little mermaid heads over to the sea witch and she makes a deal to get legs. Now, the sea witch demands payment, of course, for it, which is her voice, as it was in the Disney one. But in this one, she actually cuts off her tongue so she can no longer speak. The other side of it is the little mermaid must marry this prince in order to get an immortal soul and live forever, which is really her goal. She's a bit sad about the whole living and then just turning into sea foam. She wants the immortal soul that people have. So if the prince marries her and loves her wholeheartedly, she will get this immortal soul. However, if the prince marries someone else, the day after she will die immediately, become that sea foam that she's so scared of. But she is given more time in it. She's got more than three days. So maybe this sea witch was slightly more generous. And also more motivation. A little bit. Eternal death. Yeah, yeah. However, she did just cut her tongue out. So, you know, swings and roundabouts. So she's given this potion by the witch, swims up to the surface on the way, saying goodbye to her family forever, takes the potion, and then with a ginormous amount of pain, transforms into a human with legs. So life moved from the ocean, which was full of predators and lots of competition for food, onto land, which at the time was covered in entirely plants and had zero predators. That evolutionary jump was made about 400 million years ago, but it's something that's still going on today. Uh, there's an article in New Scientist 
by Alice Klein about fish that are evolving um, to become land dwellers because of predators. These fish, which are called blenny fish or blennies, live in Rarotonga in the largest of the Cook Islands. Um, and at low tide, these blennies are found swimming around in rock pools at the edge of the island. But when high tide moves in, instead of going into the ocean like most fish do at high tide, they instead m- climb up onto dry land and shuffle around the rocks. And what these researchers found is that this is because there's predators that swim in with the rising tide, um, like flounders and lionfish. The fish have decided to, instead of risking that in the ocean, they've evolved to instead spend time on land to avoid these predators. So these blenny fish have gills, but they also have strong tail fins that allow them to jump from rock to rock. So by avoiding predators, uh, that obviously increases their survival. And this is exactly how evolutionary pressure works. If you can, if you, the species survives better in a different place, then things that allow it to get to that place will be selected for in uh, natural selection. Now also, because Hans didn't do things lightly, Every time she walks, uh, it feels like blades are running through her feet. So at the moment, she doesn't have a voice to seduce the prince, but the sea witch said that you will be able to do it because you will be so graceful in your dancing. Never mind that it's blades through your feet. And you have very expressive eyes and you've got a nice face. So Prince, will, he'll just fall for you. You can get a long way on a nice face. That is true. It's worked for me. <laughs> no comment. She's hanging about, meets the prince, He thinks, oh, this is some cute little chick. But he thinks of her as a little sister, which was not the goal. And he treats her like a foundling. So sometimes she gets to lay just outside his door because she's so lucky and he pats her on the head sometimes. She sees a party where people sing and she gets very sad. I could sing way better than that, but then she dances. And everyone goes, oh, your dancing is the most amazing dancing ever. So... Prince thinks she's pretty cool, but sadly, not interested in her as a love interest. So he said that the only person that he could love is the girl who rescued him when he had that shipwreck, which he thinks is some random. And the Little Mermaid knows that it's actually her, but she hasn't figured out the whole writing thing to tell him. And of course, she can't speak. His parents have said, time for you to marry. You're a prince. That's what you do. So they head out to meet this other princess. And the Little Mermaid's going, no way he's going to love her. The only person he can love is that chick in the temple. And me, or so she thinks. Gets to the land, has a whole bunch of cool parties. And then he finally sees the princess that he's supposed to marry. Turns out, she was the chick who rescued him. Oh my goodness. Oh no, for the Little Mermaid. Her life is over. So throughout history, lots and lots of people have said that they've sighted mermaids. So Pliny had the Nereids, or Nereids, um, Christopher Columbus claimed that he spotted mermaids off the coast of Haiti in January of 1493. However, he did say that they were pretty ugly and had some masculine traits. Then we had sailors who found little tiny mermaids that were called Jenny Hanover's in the 1500s. And they used to actually get them and they would dry them out and then sell them in Antwerp for tourists. And people believe that they were visible proof that mermaid-like creatures lived in the ocean. John Smith, who you might recognise from another Disney story of Pocahontas, fell in love with a mermaid in 1614. Um, He says that he sighted one and he was very attracted to her, musing that her long green hair imparted to her an original character that was by no means unattractive. She also had large eyes, a finely shaped nose and well-formed ears. He began to fall in love with her until he realised that she was a fish and then decided, nope, can't love a fish. So there had been lots and lots of sightings about mermaids, but You could really put it down to a bit of hearsay because there wasn't a lot of scientific evidence behind people. Whenever they'd sighted them, people just said, oh, I saw a mermaid. Look at me go. But then there are a couple of articles that came out in the 18th century, so in the 1700s, that were published where people had scientifically examined these mermaids. So there was an article which appeared in the Gentleman's Magazine It was the 1700s. You're allowed to call things stuff like that then. Um, In December, which Jacques-Fabien Gautier, who was a really prestigious 
member of the Dijon Academy and recognised for his skill in printing images of scientific subjects. He had looked at this mermaid, examined it, recorded everything about it and then illustrated it in detail. To a lot of people, this would have then been considered almost incontrovertible proof that mermaids exist. There was a couple of other articles that then such as in the Mercure de France in April 1762, there was a story of two girls discovering an animal of a human form leaning on its hands. Um, not that pleasant. The girls then stabbed the creature and cut off its hands. But these hands were then examined by a surgeon. So, And they saw the web between the hands and the fact that it had a tail. And this once again, because a surgeon was able to back the story, helped prove that mermaids existed. And in May of 1775, the Gentleman's Magazine again published an investigation into mermaids by a merchant man who was trading to Anatolia. And then it, he had some interesting ideas about these mermaids. Let's just say he was a bit racist. Um, and he encountered mermaids that had some broader features and then was saying that they were more like African uh, mermaids and then there were the more daintily featured white mermaids and then had some ideas about race um, and how mermaids related to race. And this also reflected quite well with the idea that everything in the sea had a counterpart on land. So you had seahorses to horses, sea dogs and so on to dogs, and then people had their own counterpart being mermaids. But they also had some really, they managed to find the equivalent of the clergy in the ocean um, where they found a clergy fish because it looked like a cow, looked like it was having a cow. So this was discovered in mid 16th century by Guillaume Rondelet, and he found monks and bishops. So uh, we'll make sure that we put a photo up on the website. But they found, I I don't know if he realised that they're just clothing, so you can take them off. So perhaps the mermaid just reflected these other ones, and it was a profession choice rather than a. A choice made for them but he found mermaids that that looked like monks and mermaids that looked like bishops so around this time lots of people believed mermaids they were real there were some people who held out on it but many many highly respected thinkers did believe that mermaids were real so having met this princess and fallen in love at first sight, they plan a wedding on a boat and they uh, bring the boat out into the harbour and they're going to do a beautiful a beautiful wedding um, and the little mermaid is despondent. She's crying over the edge of the ship and then she looks down at the ocean and she sees her sisters all show up. Um, the sisters have also paid a price to the witch. They've given her ha- given their hair to the witch. I feel like that's a little bit unfair. Mm. I feel like the little mermaid should have been given that option, that she could have just had a crop cut yeah. and kept her tongue. But this sea witch works in mysterious ways, I it think seems. The, I think the little mermaid just needs to get better at uh, bartering. But she, so her sisters uh, have sold their hair to the witch for a, a, a knife. Um, if that knife is plunged into the heart of the prince, when the warm blood falls upon the little mermaid's feet, the, her feet will grow together again and form into a fish's tail. And then she can return to the sisters to live out her 300 years before she dies and is dead forever. So they say, kill the prince and come back. In a few minutes, the sun will rise and then you'll die. The little mermaid goes into the prince's tent on the ship and she has the knife in hand and she's ready to stab the prince as he lays there with his new bride. But then... She can't go through with it, and she instead throws the knife into the ocean and then throws herself into the sea just as the sun rises, which is when she was fated to die. But she says, it doesn't feel like dying. And instead of sinking through the ocean, she floats out of the ocean and she floats above the waves because she hasn't died. She's turned into a spirit of the air. So mermaids, they live for 300 years and then they die forever. 
humans live their lives, and then when they die, they get have mortal souls, so they head off into the great hereafter. The Daughters of the Air have a different deal, which is that they have to spend 300 years doing good deeds around the world, just as the Little Mermaid tried to do a good deed at some point in the story. But by not murdering the prince, I think. Uh, okay, I suppose that's a good deed. So she gets a deal where she has to spend 300 years with them doing good deeds, and after that, she gets an immortal soul and gets to go to heaven. After 300 years, thus, we shall float into the kingdom of heaven, and we may even get there sooner, whispered one of her companions. Unseen, we can enter the houses of men where there are children, and for every day on which we find a good child who is the joy of his parents and deserves their love, our time of probation is shorted. The child does not know when we fly through the room that we smile with joy at his good conduct, for we can count one year less of our 300 years. But when we see a naughty or a wicked child, we shed tears of sorrow, and for every tear, a day is added to our time of trial. So if Santa doesn't work to get your kids to be good, this one really hammers home. Not only can bad children get coal and kill fairies, also, Little Mermaid, you're making her trial longer and cry. That's a rough deal for... (laughs) <laughs> air spirits for the kid for everyone involved mm. i think this is sketchy contracts here i think we've already worked this out she's not a good negotiator so we've only explored about five percent of the ocean so maybe mermaids are just super duper crafty and are hiding out there but most of the reports so far and investigations have determined that despite the centuries of belief and the fact that they decorate Boats, they decorate temples, churches, the world over. It is very unlikely that mermaids exist. But you can see them a lot in popular culture, including, of course, Disney's The Little Mermaid and the upcoming live-action Disney's Little Mermaid. So it shows that even though they've pretty much been disproven, people still love the idea of mermaids, though perhaps the Disney version a little bit more than the Hans Christian Andersen one. Thank you very much for listening. And join us next time uh, on Crumbs of Science where we'll be talking about Rumpelstiltskin and the science behind alchemy. Until then, we hope you have a happily ever after. 